Welcome to Ear Crush, the Friday podcast for people who love listening to great stories. I'm pretty sure we're going to have a batch of new listeners for this episode, so I'd like to take a minute and just tell people what we do here at Ear Crush. To start, I'm Stephen Campbell. I'm the host of Ear Crush, and I'm also in charge of audio production for LMBPN Publishing. Each Friday, Ear Crush brings listeners professionally narrated and produced stories in the form of a podcast. As a part of our weekly get-togethers, we turn the spotlight on the people who create these audio stories. If you're an audio geek like I am, this show is a great opportunity to get to know more about narrators as well as the authors who write the stories and to learn a bit more about the audio production process. If that sounds interesting to you, please subscribe and join us each Friday. We'd love to welcome you into our growing community. For those of you who are regular listeners, thanks for joining us again. We've got something kind of cool for you today. As many of you know, the Cartharian Gambit series finished with Life Goes On, book number 21 in the series. That book was published on Valentine's Day earlier this year, and we've been racing to catch up with Michael since that day. Well, I'm pleased to announce that we clicked the publish button on the audio version of Life Goes On earlier this week, which means that, fingers crossed here, it could be available at Amazon, Audible, and iTunes in the next 10 days or so. So to celebrate the end of the audio series, I sat down via Skype with the author, Michael Anderley, and our narrator, Emily Beresford, to chat about what the process was like to produce this massive series in audio. Our original intent was to release this entire interview as part of the audiobook, but we learned that we were limited with the amount of bonus material we could add to the end of a book without negating our ability to offer WhisperSync to listeners. WhisperSync is that cool thing, for those of you who don't know, that allow you to switch back and forth between an ebook and an audiobook and, and be at the same place. So we want to make that available, so we're limited to what we can, what we can do at the end of an audiobook. So we decided to compromise. We put about 12 minutes of this conversation at the end of the audiobook, and this is the full interview with Emily, Michael, and me. Yes, there may be rambling, there may be laughter, and there may be stories, but we think this was a great way to wrap up the Cartharian Gambit series. Oh, and one last thing for those of you concerned about this, for the Bethany Ann audio fans out there, Emily will be starting on book one of the Cartharian Endgame next week. So stay tuned for news on the audio release of Payback is a Bitch. We'll be back to our regular format of short chats with authors or narrators and then a professionally narrated short story next week. So please subscribe and join us. Now, let's get to the series-ending interview for the Cartharian Gambit. Thank you for listening to Life Goes On, and for at least some of you for listening to all 21 books in the Cartharian Gambit series. My name is Stephen Campbell, and I'm here with the two people who have brought these audiobooks to life, the author, Michael Anderley, and our narrator, Emily Beresford. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be here. Exactly. I don't think you're going to be able to... uh, not understand which one is not Emily Beresford. Not after 21 books. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I'm Michael Anderley. <laughs> <laughs> not an Emily Beresford. <laughs> Welcome to the Cursey Green Gambit. Oh. The after party, the after show. The, uh, apparently we've all been drinking too much and it's not even noon somewhere. <laughs> so. so Emily, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away... Michael contacted you about narrating the Cartharian Gambit. Let's let's go let's go back in time and and how did oh, wow. this how did this all come to be? And I, I want to know as well what you were doing at the time. What kind of things were you narrating at the time? A lot of science fiction? <laughs> <laughs> Not too much science fiction at the time. Um I have a I have a heavy background in erotica under a different name. Which I know, I know you've listened to all of it, Steve. So you're you're very familiar with all that work. Um, but this is maybe 19 or 20 months ago. Do you think? Yeah, Michael? I'm trying to find it. Mm-hmm. I mean, is it under your what? Would I find your email under your name? Because I'm I'm sure. Oh, you're emailed. looking at email. Mm. I know. I'm going all the way back there because it was 26. It was 2016. In February. I, well, January maybe we started. 
Yeah, but I talked to you before, and you had weeks yeah. of books already that you had to do. Yes. But uh, um, you gave me an, an amazing email, and I was looking for a long time. I'd already gone through 20 people, 30 people, and uh, I had narrowed it down to just a few. And I was looking for that person that was excited about doing this and wasn't shy when it came to 21 potential books. <laughs> and I was... <laughs> You know, so, I almost didn't even audition because I thought, you know, there's no way I would ever, you know, there's no way I'm going to land this. And, but I just, I wanted it so bad because it was just a dream job for me. It was a dream series, uh, dream character, lead heroine, um, badass female. And I'm so happy I did and was thrilled that you even contacted me back. So I'm still yeah. thrilled. Yeah, yeah, I know. That that's probably the better part of all of this. Oh, heck, she, she still likes it. <laughs> and then, um, so yeah, so I'd gone through ACX and I was trying to find people. This is my first effort. And I, I felt that what had to happen is I had to have first Bethany Ann's voice. Very similar to when we did the book covers and we, we did those. I needed Bethany Ann's eyes in that case. And so I had gone through quite a few, but I also wanted someone who was going to be able to do men uh, in a believable fashion. And so, uh, and then the, the third thing that I was looking for is that they could read, basically, could they read the yellow pages and make it fun? That was my, my three areas. And then Emily gave me this great, it's actually on ACX, it's in the first uh, account. And then she, you know, she approached me and she talked about how this was something she really was passionate about doing. And so when I awarded it, I also looked back and said, hey, can I contact you? And, you know, can we talk about this? And I was surprised to find out that I was only the second author you had ever spoken to. Ever. Yes. And it was, it's always awesome to have that personal connection um, because it, it makes the books even mean even more to me personally, actually having talked to the author and you become a real person in my mind instead of a, you know, like a, a I guess another character that I have never spoken with. So. Um, that, that really added to the whole experience. And before we get into the detail, I'm going to jump ahead and Steve's probably going to go, damn you. And so <laughs> we met you, uh, Steve and I did, in New York. Yes. And at APAC. And it was, it was something that I found interesting because I asked the question after having this discussion with you related to talking to an author. And I found out that one of the reasons a lot of air audio narrators don't talk to authors is because the company that's behind them doesn't want it to happen. And I was shocked to hear that. Yes, a lot of times we're not allowed to contact the author at all when we're given a book. It's um, because th I think there's so many different uh, people it goes through when it gets to the audio finally. Mm -hmm. um, so th that's that was always my previous experience, except for one other time. So it, it was it's almost secretive a lot of the times before that. You have to get special permission to reach out to the author for anything, usually. So this was so personable. You know, it was just fantastic. And it was an absolute delight to meet you in New York. And I, my wife and I were walking. We're in New York. We have no idea where we're going because we're rarely in New York. And we're walking down the sidewalk into, I don't know, under a bridge and into this area. And I had seen pictures of Emily back when she had longish hair. <laughs> and this person, I, we walked in and this person with really short hair says, are you Steve? <laughs> I'm like, yes. <laughs> and it's, Which is so funny for me. It's so funny for me because usually I'm kind of shy and reserved, but I saw you guys and I just, it was like something clicked. I'm like, oh my God, that's Steve. I have to go up and say hi. <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah, I look a little bit different uh, from my headshots, my previous headshots to now. So I'm redoing them pretty soon. So you can recognize me next time. Phew. Well, you you are absolutely the embodiment of your voice when you meet you in person because your shoes lit up, your face <laughs> and eyes and smile lit up, and you were just constantly moving. There was like zero um, – well, I guess we use a lot of language in books, so it's not good. You had zero fucks to give anyone if they didn't like how you were. <laughs> to be completely honest, it's that's been kind of a transformation for me over the past couple of years. And it's very liberating to finally be at that spot. So thank you for that. And, you know, uh, kind of experiencing a lot of awesomeness through through this series and Bethany Ann also, uh, that kind of, 
I guess, assisted on my journey to get where I am. So that's, it, it goes pretty deep for me, just so you know. <laughs> that's really cool. I had no idea. I just presumed that you were always like this. Not, not really. Um, I mean, I've always tried to be outgoing, but now mm. I'm, I don't care as much what people think at all. So, and that makes you, that makes you more comfortable in your own skin, which is great. It's very, uh, very empowering. So. Well, we, we have had nothing but a lot of fans really love your, uh, adaptation of the Carthurian Gambit. And back in the beginning, I remember I screwed up because I told you originally I committed to seven books mm -hmm. because I knew I could afford seven books, but that, you know, that's, that's a big chunk of change. And I didn't know if anyone was going to want to read them. So I, I failed to tell you after like book two or three when we knew that these were going to to, to actually make money. But I never updated you and, and you were like, well, are we going on? And I'm like, well, yeah, we've been going on for months. We, did, didn't you get the memo? Yeah, <laughs> I didn't my, I didn't have my mind reading hat on. Oh, you failed that test. <laughs> oh, darn you. And that, that led to something else. It led to what, what I think we should just call the competition. Oh God, let's not. <laughs> do you do you want to share what the competition is, Emily? Because you're the one who started it. <sighs> I thought I could catch Michael Anderley, who is inhuman and works so fast, and the stories just like seep from him. But no, he's. I tried to stay even in his rear view, but I wasn't even close. So <laughs> I'll I'll own it. That's fine. I hopefully I'll have uh, more opportunity to catch him, catch you in the future. Yeah. Catch if you if you can. Um, yeah, so actually, you lit a fire under my ass. I'm like, she did not. Damn it. Because <laughs> I, I should have been, I I been secretive about it then. It probably, because yeah. I was having to do the Michael books as well. So I was book here, then book that one, then book here. Then, you know, so it was getting yeah. to be a distance. And then I think you got sick or the hurricane came or something and wiped you out for a month. Probably sick. I have little germ incubators in my house so i'm always <laughs> sick so yes. so that happens so i mean mm -hmm. you have a legit reason but yeah i i, I couldn't bl i was listening to your your version and this is a good way to bring it up but mm -hmm. your version of the audio notes when you laid that down and i'm like son of a bitch <laughs> <laughs> she just did this in audio to everybody listening yeah i you know sometimes i get a little ahead of myself but that's okay. <laughs> it was it was fun for everybody. So I got, you know, I was always getting messages from listeners uh, asking how it was going and some trash talking. And, you know, it was, all, it was all fun. So it was great. Let's talk about the narrator notes, because that's something that I don't know of it, that of anyone else having done this before you did it, Emily. And, and Michael asked you if you would be willing to do this, something along the lines of the author notes that he'd written for all the books. And, and what went through your mind when he asked that? Well, at first I was just, oh shit, I, what, what do I do for this? Because you know, it's not something that I've, I'd ever thought of doing um, before. But then I got so excited because I could actually give my take on what happened in the book and my favorite scenes and try to connect with the listeners more um, with that to see if some of my favorite stuff that happened was their favorite and was kind of like closure for each book, mm -hmm. especially when Michael died. That was, that was the worst one. Yeah. I got you didn't take that well. You no, kind of went after Michael no. in those. And and you went you went after the surviving Michael. Well, yes. Yes, those. Michael Anderley. Of course. <laughs> Doesn't everybody when they read or listen to that part? I got after that book went live, I had messages, people, you know, angry, angry messages from <laughs> listeners blaming me for it. Like it was your yeah, you had <laughs> you had switched no. the series and done this. <laughs> no, but I, I felt the same way they did, so I could completely you know, understand that anger and frustration. So. Oh man, the whole story behind that is, I, I think I released that book on a Friday and by Saturday I was already messaging people on the Facebook group. Hey, hey, just so you know, secret thing coming, Michael, you know, the second dark ages will arrive here in six months or some noise, you know, it's like, God, people are not happy. Mm. Yeah. You know, I, I feel a little bit better now. I think you really redeemed yourself. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm I'm willing to forgive now that I've had a long time to uh, to kind of sort through my feelings about it. Well, good because you know you're still behind. <laughs> I oh man, yes, I know. <laughs> I mean, come on, we I gave you six months to catch up before uh -oh. Criterion Endgame Book One came out. I know. 
I'm slow, but I will not be slow any longer or as okay. slow, as slow. <laughs> Let me say not as slow. Well, Stephen, don't you have uh, Emily on a few other series now? Well, of course we do. We have, and I don't even want to get into how far behind she is I on know. these, but we are just in, just in the world of the, of the Cartharian Gambit. We've, we've just we're, we just released, oh, and I'm drawing a blank on the name of Natalie's series. Uh, um, Andy Roberts the series. Er, 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 uh, Etheric Academy series. Etheric Academy. So we just released three, and we'll do four soon. Um, I, did I just send you Protect, payback? Protected uh, by the Damned, number three. <laughs> okay, all right. So so, oh, don't laugh. Yeah. <laughs> so that, for, for those who aren't listening to Protected by the Damned, uh, that went to eight, and then the series name changed, and and there's another six. Uh, yeah, so seven we're at comes fourteen. Out Friday. Okay, okay, so we're at fifteen on that, and you're at three. Okay, no problem. And we're at three in the Cartharian in game at you're and you're at zero. Okay, and so you know there's there's a little bit of catch up to do. I I'm I'm up for it. But we're saving you so much time because we're not asking you to do narrator notes. So I'm I'm thinking that's going to save like a oh. month each book. <laughs> yes. Because you did such a great job with your narrator notes that I, that had to take a lot of work. Well, well I'm going to say yes. And inquiring <laughs> minds want to know, were your narrator notes off the cuff or were they scripted? Well, I would make notes. That's why I rambled so bad because it wasn't scripted. <laughs> but I would, you know, write down... Uh, notes in the margin of favorite scenes or something I wanted to mention. And then I would write them on paper because I, that's how I roll <laughs> and have the paper in front of me and then talk about it. I was talking to Steve earlier today and I had to admit that I'm like, I really hope she wrote those because Stephen is the one that actually said, I think she, she writes all these out. And I'm like, oh, thank God. Because if you listen to her, you realize she's talking without any ums, any uhs. And it, for her to be mm -hmm. able to do that, it caused me to just not feel very tall. <laughs> oh well so, I, I i do have the edit button though remember no I don't so, if, oh. so i mean i didn't edit a ton but it's editing is my friend this is why all this live stuff is usually i'm sweating and shaking okay well, i understand that better so we go back to book the first part the first seven books the first arc if you will where bethany ann is still on earth and she has to come through and what kind of are the highlights to you of them on Earth? And what characters did you find interesting that maybe you didn't think would be fun? Well, I would have to say I loved kind of how she she embraced her new life and, and getting the news that she didn't have long to live and then uh, going to talk to her father and just how she, she just seemed to jump right into it, have a vision and just become even more badass. So when it first started out, I thought she was a complete badass, awesome woman. And then that's before she had any enhancements mm -hmm. at all. And then she just becomes this, this amazing, I don't even know how to put it, just this amazing character that encompasses everything that, that I dreamed about as a kid being, or dream about now, fantasize being now. <laughs> this is who Bethany Ann is. Um, <laughs> But I have to say my my favorite character probably in the series, I have such a soft spot for Bobcat. Really? <laughs> yes, I love him. I don't know why. <laughs> He's just, I love him. Uh, Bobcat and, and Gene Dukes, of course, because anybody that has an imagination and can come up with the amazing, well, obviously you're behind all this, but Gene. No, that's fine. <laughs> uh, I'm going to talk about them like they're people, not, well, they not coming from your mind, yes. <laughs> just all the just amazing destructive stuff she comes up with that's i wish my brain worked like that it's it's just incredible so i love that kind of getting to know gene more and kind of like her soft spot with john further mm -hmm. further on so that that was fun but man interesting. what did you think of now that we're on gene and john what did you think of it whenever gene was very possessive of john i thought it i mean made sense kind of because she I feel in my mind is kind of more of a, a an alpha mm -hmm. woman anyways. So she wouldn't want anybody kind of encroaching on her territory, but I love the banter um, with Diane and Doreen. Mm -hmm. um, 
Oh my God. I just love that. Uh, but it made, it made sense to me, the, the possessiveness and I'm, I'm not a possessive person, but it, I feel like it really made sense with her character. The interesting, uh, some backstory on Dan and Doreen, they're actually, we call them, uh, they're sisters and we call them the double D yeah. and the person, uh, T.S. Paul, the author, T.S. Paul, Scott Paul is the one I think who first introduced them as characters in the Carthagian Gambit. And so we made them you know, have all of this fun, but occasionally we might have to ask the real lady, would you be okay if we did this? Oh, and that's they, so cool. Yeah, they never turned it down. They, if anything, they would amp it up to 11. Oh, that's awesome. That's so cool. Those are the type of women that I would like to know and have in my life. <laughs> They are. They have been such an amazing part of the the history of Carthagian Gambit. That's so cool, and I love how they're written into the story. Then that's just it's just amazing. Have we done anything? I mean, because there was quite a few times that once the audiobook started coming out, I would get people asking me, "When's the next one coming?" And I was very manly, and I said, um, "Here's Emily's Facebook group. Go ask her." <laughs> and I love that. I got so many people, you know, and that's good. It's good for me. It's good for me <laughs> to have to have uh, somebody to answer to and to explain and um, <laughs> to let them know. So I have even the same day that a book comes out, I get questions you know when's the next one coming out so i like to sh i like to allow people to shoulder the burden of <laughs> yes. excited fans and, That's, and it's, i i'm all for it <laughs> send anybody my way i love chatting with people it has been it you, you've been such an amazing part of just the success of this uh this group this audio program and getting involved in it in such a way such as what we're doing right now we have asked uh, a couple of other times and other narrators shy away from being out, you know, just out there. And so, you know, we certainly honor that. That's great. But to have you do it right away has been such a cool experience for us. Well, I've been thrilled with it. And I think, you know, it's not just the series, it's you guys also, because there's such a, a connection and, and I immediately felt like friends with you guys. And so that, that was a lot for me too, because I wouldn't normally probably do any of this. I'm normally like I said before, a little shy and reserved, but, um, this... Are you buying this, Stephen? <laughs> I am not buying that at all. I, I've, I've been around her, I think on three different days and I've never even seen the tiniest hint of shy or reserved, <laughs> except maybe the shoes she wore the night of the Audi awards that were light up shoes. <laughs> if you can believe that of a shy and reserved person who's just trying to melt behind the curtain. Well, I changed a little bit but really it's i i feel like people that i respect and enjoy being around i would do anything for so it, i thank you for bringing me out of my shell a bit to do stuff like this so. well doing anything for i am um, somewhere around book seven eight i don't know but the, um it was coming to halloween and i decided to write i don't know maybe it's a thousand words or something and i just asked you i said hey you know would you mind narrating this real quick and you did it, and the reality is you spoiled me so early that I just had this expectation that everybody would do these little things. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I should have let you know that. It's, I, and once again, I it's not necessarily that I would always do it. I just, I don't know. I love doing everything Carthier and Gambit related. You know, I'm I'm a huge fan. So and it was it, it was. Fun. You did this. Maybe um, we can put it on ear crush. It's, it's not very long, but it's Bethany Ann at a time when um, a mom and you know a husband that needs to go away, and uh, she comes in and steps in and makes things happen. And since you mentioned ear crush, there are going to be probably twenty thousand people listening to this who have never heard of ear crush before. And so, ear crush is a weekly podcast that we do where we have LMBPN narrators come in and narrate stories that aren't otherwise being made into audiobooks, and we have the narrators as guests. And the first guest on the first episode of Ear Crush was our favorite, Emily. And it yeah, was the I first can... podcast I've ever done, and it was, it was fun. And you said you were nervous, oh, and you man. were perfect. Super nervous. So, but that's how I roll. I'm, an, I'm a nervous person. <laughs> <laughs> you're a nervous person who produces. Yeah, no, you're yeah, a Chihuahua narrator. Yeah. I am shaking. <laughs> <laughs> what would be something if you, uh, um, 
If you tried to describe Carthagian Gambit in your words, what is the experience? I would say it's it's fresh. I mean, it's it's not something that I had done before, and there's something for everyone. I swear, there's something for everyone, uh, whether your background is military, whether you love science fiction, you love paranormal, um, you love kind of like suspense or somebody who uh, fights for people who can't fight for themselves. It's there's a little bit of everything. So I think everybody would love this series. And what about all of the cursing? Oh, God, I love it. <laughs> it feels so good. And I always love to see what you're going to come up with. I was reading your author notes. And what was it? A douche twaffle? Yeah. You... <laughs> oh, man. I just I always love to see what you come up with. It's amazing. Do you have something that produces this for you? How do you come up with these? What you uh, come up with? Well, there's enough people out there that probably have uh, have noticed it, but there is a cursing generator, and you click oh, a button, no way. and it comes okay. up with stuff. But the problem is that a lot of it I don't like, or it doesn't even make any sense. So either fans have given me some of those, I've come up with a big chunk of them, but at times when I just can't think of anything, I would I'd hit the button and go, and I'd keep hitting until I found a word or a phrase I liked, and then I would keep doing it until I got the one. You know, I was able to uh, Frankenstein together the phrase that I wanted. Oh, that's awesome. That's very cool. Yeah, no, it felt very cathartic to be able to. You know, ever since kids, I used to be able to swear freely, and then I've had to really clean it up. So <laughs> now I can I can privately do it in my foam walls here. So it's lovely. What about uh, the scenes whenever I would uh, have, usually it's Team BMW that does this, but they would start on some phrase and then they'd go, well, that's not the way you say it. For instance, if they were going to talk about sex and they would just have 30 or 40 versions of what to call sex. Oh, there, there was a scene that I just popped into my head. Uh, wasn't it Tina and mm -hmm. Marcus before they were together and coming up with however many they had to do like 21 mm -hmm. different, or she <laughs> had to come up with 21 different phrases. Oh yes. That's it's, it's awesome. It's fantastic. And I, I always learn something too. I try to help, you know, education <laughs> is a very important part of my life. Yes. Now that we've made it all the way to the end and, and we know not the end of the story because there's still more, there's still more to play out in the Cretharian end game, but the end of the Cretharian Gambit series itself, what did you think of that ending? It felt good for, I mean, starting back a couple books ago, knowing that uh, Michael and Bethany Ann were going to reunite mm -hmm. um, and then to have it happen, that felt good. And then to find out that there is a little baby knocked on the way that, you know, that was so exciting. For, you know, it just it makes the possibilities endless and you wonder what this child is going to become. It's just it's it's awesome. I Very forget exciting. that. Yeah, I forget that people don't know the result of that. And I'm like, oh, didn't you? Oh, never mind. I can't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, I could read way ahead, but I almost, I f I'm scared to death to get too far ahead because I'm afraid my voice is going to give something away if, if there's um, something. Mark. I just, because I, I want to experience it kind of with the listeners. Um, obviously, I read the book before I record, but not. I don't go further than the next book I'm reading um, or going to narrate because I have this huge fear that uh, some inflection or something will give something away if I know something. Have you ever gone through the process of tearing up when you were? Oh, of course. I don't mean when you're reading it, but when you're oh. when you're narrating or, or yes. have you worked through that? Have you? OK. Oh, definitely. Um, chills. Uh, one scene in particular. I don't remember what book it is, but it's when they're on the yacht. And mm -hmm. sending all the, you know, the people out to sea and then Peter steps up and says his bit. And that that still is really stuck with me because then we almost kind of see Peter growing up. And mm -hmm. that was a big, a big part of that. Yeah, that scene right there. I, I know which one you're talking about. And it's when they they deliver justice. It's, mm -hmm. The justice is raw and it's right there. And Peter, and, and to your point, it's like as I put myself back into that scene and feeling the emotions that come from that one, when he comes up and he just kind of says, you know, no, this this is me. It's my time. Yep. 
and he s- stepped up. You know, he starts out, we see him as this like punk ass kid who takes nothing seriously. And then we really see how he's kind of molded, how John kind of helps him find himself and become who he was meant to be. So that was a, a really a powerful scene for me. Um, and yeah, there's been several that I've definitely been teary while while recording, but I try to just go with it. Uh, to kind of keep the the emotion in the read itself. Oh, that's so cool. So, Stephen, how about we do this? At least I've got one more question that I, I that I thought of. Um, then I'll let you have it back again. So I'm okay. jumping around and I'm moving up to like books 18, 19, 20, that, that frame, and Baba Yaga. Oh, God, I love her. I love her. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, she's so, so more, more. Oh, God, she's so badass. She's just death walking oh <sighs> you, you see this bifurcation of bethany ann's personality mm-hmm. you know and you know for a bit there i i was wondering if she was going to come back um because for some people once you go so far um or other characters that i've thought about or read that you know there's a line where mm-hmm. if they lose themselves then they don't come back and that was a lot of like uh emotional Uh, read for me as well when people were recording their videos to her um, Mm -hmm. to be sent to her because you know they're missing her and wondering if she will be coming back and but uh, Baba Yaga is just so badass that's I want to be Baba Yaga's friend on her good side (laughs) (laughs) yeah because I it's interesting as I was trying to wrap up that third arc and I don't know I mean by the time you hit 21 books it is rough and you have all of these open threads and you're trying to figure out which ones you can accomplish closing up and which ones you just can either have to leave open or bring to the next series. Right. So we have the question in book one in the author notes, you know, I asked myself as much as I explained to anyone else, if you gave this person, this type of person who loves justice, carte blanche, where would she go? Mm. And at that time with, uh, you know, almost 200 years old, she is seeing all of this as I'm thinking to myself, you know, we, we see a lot of years where we tell no story because we couldn't fit it all into 21 sure. books. But we look through it and she is just tired of politics. Bethany Ann was never a political person. And so by having to constrain that side of her, it blew out. It blew up. Mm-hmm. And she moved into the Baba Yaga that she felt needed to occur and then still had to hide who it was. Sure. And you, it was so beautifully orchestrated there because I, I just, it just, it really added so much to the story and then to allow her to kind of embrace that fully and kind of pretty much have no one to answer to. Then for her to come back from that, I feel like that really helped her frame of mind. And I feel like it, it just kind of solidified what she wanted to do in the future as well, as far as not being as political. Oh, so. um, I'm going to say this is my same question, part two, Stephen. So I, <laughs> I don't, don't give me shit about this. And that is, what about the scene where she abdicates her throne? When she's telling Which, everyone, I'm stepping oh down. Oh my God. So I loved how, how it was kind of, she had talked about how she was going to do it and then did it her own way. Is mm-hmm. that what you're, oh my mm-hmm. God. But that was, that's quintessential Bethany Ann right there. And I loved that. And I was cheering in the, you know, in the, you just get so excited because everybody thought it was going to go one way and then, nope, she's going to do it her own way and go out in her own style. And that was just awesome. Um, Very fitting. Very, very well done, sir. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Ask questions that only get her. Yep. That's what you were going for. I knew that. (laughs) All right, Stephen, it's your turn. There's no part C to that last question? No, no, there's All right. not. Uh, this is a question for both of you. I want to start with, with you, Michael. Where did the idea come from to write the author notes, and how did they evolve over the course of 21 books? All right, so this is one of those things where I just have to lay down the bearing my soul part because, you know, before I was a, an author, which I did at like 47, 48 years of age, I had had a lot of businesses, and I had been – involved in marketing and engagement and sales copy and everything else. And so I'm writing this first book. Now, John Conroe is um, an author that I really enjoyed. And so there was a couple of times he had 
he had mentioned something I had read, and it allowed me to, uh, to feel the connection with him as an author. He told the story of how he decided to come up with the Demon Accords, and it struck a nerve. So I decided when I finished that first book, I knew it wasn't perfect. I knew that it, it had some foibles. And I knew that if someone were to write something like an author note, just saying, hey, this is who I am, that a few people who enjoyed the story well enough that if they felt a connection to me, they might not give me a really poor review. Maybe they just don't give me a review at all. And so I started it by wanting to just kind of lay down my thoughts of, on the matter, knowing at least 20 to 30 percent of the reason that I was doing it was also going, and please don't give me a bad review. <laughs> please, please, please. And so that started it uh, going forward and, and just the opportunity to see what John Conroe had done with just like a paragraph explanation of how the Demon Accords came about because he was reading Twilight, I think. And he explains that it's like, these aren't vampires. This is vampire. And so I started it, but I just went, you know, overboard like I tend to do. So he might have had a couple of paragraphs and I had, you know, five pages of author notes. But how did they evolve over the 21 books? You, ha you had the original goal with books maybe one, two, and three. And then, you know, over time, they changed. Correct. And part of that is because I had so many that I was doing because as a company, right? So for a year, it was mostly myself. That's what happened. And then the next year was a bunch of collaborations and then so on and so forth. But part of it is the maturity of what I went through. In the very beginning, it was all about me, Andy Ryder, and fans. That's all I had. That was my whole experience. I did not know if something was going to be successful. I was bearing the truth of this journey that I was going through each and every time releasing a book. And while the stage fright of feeling as I leave or release a book, it's never totally gone. But it was certainly a lot less where in books one, two, and three, there's no one cheering me on. I mean, I didn't even explain to my wife I was writing these books. She didn't know until between books two and three when she looked over in the bed at me one night as we're all doing things, you know, she's reading on her iPad for work or whatever, and I'm typing. She's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, well, I'm writing or I'm publishing my book. She's like, what book? And then I have to go show her books one and two. And so she's like, you've been publishing books? So I, this journey was very personal. And I'm just sharing with the fans what it is like to do this. Okay, and for Emily, I'm going to twist the question around a little bit because I know you read all of Michael's author notes. What was it like for you to read them with each book? I mean, what, what was the sense you got of the journey? I loved the author notes. And actually, my proofer contacted me and said how much she loves the author notes because she learns so much more. Um, I don't remember exactly the, the beginning author notes, but I feel like it went just from uh, kind of a little bit of background and, um, you know, thanking the listeners, of course, to learning also specifics about what's going on behind the scenes and what's going on um, with with LMBPN itself and everything else you're doing. And it gives kind of a broader view. And I'll go back to that connection, uh, a deeper connection with the listener or reader um, to you guys. And I think it's brilliant that Michael mentioned it, that if you get to know the author more than just the book, that yes, you're going to feel more of a connection. And even if you didn't totally enjoy the book, you're going to say, hey, he seems like a really stand up awesome guy. I'm not going to do a bad review. <laughs> I mean, even if I didn't like it, but that's, it's just, that's the thing. But I, I think that uh, the author notes are brilliant because it, it, kind of takes the story further. Um, it makes you think more uh, about the, the series as a whole um, and kind of layers it a bit, a bit more. Michael, do you ever go back and, and read the early author notes? Occasionally when I have to answer a question or something in my mind is, is there, and certainly for books 20 and 21, I went back mm -hmm. to go, what was I thinking? You know, I know that I had that question, but what was that question? I haven't done it necessarily recently as we are producing so many additional books. I look forward at one point, it's been on my mind, should I ever pull together 
the author notes from the hundreds of books that we've done in order and put them into something because it is effectively my own diary. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. And I, 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 whenever we make an update to a book, I wind up going back and just looking at the author notes again, just kind of as a reminder to, in, in some instances, what was it like three months ago or what was it like a year and a half ago? And it's just fascinating how far things have gone. I mean, in an early, I don't remember which one, an early Cartherian Gambit author notes, you're sharing reviews. And that was something you did early mm -hmm. on. And I think in one of those author notes, you said, I'm going to keep doing this until I get whatever the number was, 100? Was it 100? 50. 50. Yeah, okay, 50. 50 reviews. And so people would leave the reviews and you would put them in there and you'd put them in good, bad, or indifferent. Whatever they were, you'd put them in. And to a certain point, and then I said, you know what? I'm not doing it beneath this point because those people aren't even reading these review these books anymore. So why mm -hmm. give them? And then I would answer them. And that was the the agreement between us. And as we got close to 50, I think we did it two books or something. And all of a sudden, they just blew up. And I had like 20, 12 hours to get them all, write answers to them and get them published. And I was kind of looking at myself going, what the hell did you do to yourself? <laughs> Emily, let's turn this around on Stephen for a minute. Stephen, you oh. weren't part of any of this in the beginning. What did you think as I called you and asked you questions? Because you actually have two of your own podcasts which is how I found out about you, one in mystery, one on the authoring business called, imaginatively enough, Author Biz. So I got to know you through that, but then I needed someone to help me in a certain set of areas and skill sets you have. Now, to give the, the listeners any sort of background, you have gray hair, which is makes you look very esteemed, and you have already been the C CFO of two more Fortune 500 companies in your life. You are an entrepreneur with multiple companies to your name, and you are, quote, quote, retired. Yes, and I, I actually went through a process when I decided to get out of the technology business where I hired a change coach because I wasn't ready to do nothing. I just wanted to do something that I wanted to do. And so I hired this person, and believe it or not, the first question they asked me was, what is it you've always wanted to do that you've never done? And I, being a stupid person, had never even – thought of that before. And the first thing I said was, I want to write a book. And so because <laughs> don't even start. <laughs> but so what I've always done is if I'm interested in something, I start learning about it. And then I start sharing it through blog posts or podcasts or whatever. So I started the author biz because it was a way to connect with people who could help me better understand the, the business of writing. And so when Michael came to me and mm -hmm you know, said, can you help with this? The way I interpreted that was, hey, I've got this amazing thing going on. And if you want, you can stick your head underneath the tent and see what's going on. And I'm like, yeah, I am in. Whatever you want me to do, I'm doing it. Damn it. I could have had it and for keeper. <laughs> <laughs> so oh. he kept saying, you know, every every three or four weeks, he'd say, well, do you, would you be interested in doing this? I'm like, yep. And it just it just went on like that, and you know I've <laughs> I've become so involved in in the things that LMBPN is doing, and I'm learning so much, and have learned so much about an industry that just I find endlessly fascinating. I was I was completely over the technology business, but publishing is is just something that continues to fascinate me to this day, and it's been three or four years since I've been exploring it and the last couple, I think, with uh, LMBPN. And it's, it's been an unbelievable ride and I'm so grateful for the opportunity. And I'm, not, I'm, I'm cutting that out. It, that won't make it into the final. <laughs> oh, what a nice ending to that. <laughs> no. Oh, you that have was to awesome. That, uh, that's, that's awesome to learn because I didn't, I, I don't, I'm late to the party. Um, so I don't know all this background. So that's, that was cool. Well, and, and the really cool thing is, at least for me, is that I have, since I was old enough to listen to audiobooks, been listening to audiobooks, love audiobooks. And while I love sports, I would much rather meet an audiobook narrator than a baseball player or a football player or anything like that, because narrators are heroes to me. They take this material and they pipe it into my brain in such a way that the story becomes so much more real. 
And when Michael said, do you want to get involved in the audio production? I'm like, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I can do that. Well, it's interesting because and it, this might be too much inside baseball. I doubt it because if you're in audio books like I have been, like you have been, like Emily is, we enjoy learning what's going on. And the audio book business is r- dramatically different from an indie publisher side. If I want to publish a book, I have enough knowledge to say that if I have a computer and I can type it, I know how to try to make it very cheaply, very inexpensive for me to publish that book, easily within two or three hundred dollars. Audio, on the other hand, is not. And so if you have a series, you almost have an obligation as a publisher to, to commit to putting almost all the books out. But with that, I'm talking to Stephen. Now, Stephen looks mature. He looks esteemed. I, however, don't always come across that way. And so when we had to start working with SAG-AFTRA, so the Screen Actors Guild, and we had this meeting with them, I'm like, Stephen, I'm going to need you to take point on this because I don't, I think you probably come across a little better. And so we'd have these conversations and I would just, you know, give him a text or a note going, I just want to rip, I'm just so frustrated. He's like, probably shouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I won't. And, but we were able to work out with them a, 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 a connection because it, it's, it's a little bit more money, which I don't care. I would rather people have the insurance and have the other things that are going on. But the, the, I'm trying to express the sparkle in your eyes when we met in New York for the APAC was such. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Was, that was so much fun. I mean, that, that first night. It was, <laughs> it, was, it was like a – yeah, it was so awesome. For me, because, you know, I, I'd only well, what is talk APAC? to you guys online. Got- yeah, explain to, to the listeners what APAC is. Oh, it's the Audio Publishers Association Conference. Um, and it's basically where you can go learn either from the publishing side of audiobooks or for narrators as well. And it's in New York City once a year. And you can learn different aspects of kind of honing your craft or how to get into the publishing or for publishers to learn what's going on in the industry. So there's, there's probably 700 to 1,000 people at the APAC this year. Oh, and yes. And it grows every year. So and the, it's getting and bigger, audies, bigger. The audis, mm-hmm. which you were um, potentially getting an audi this year, that was there. And so yes. we go as LMBPN. Now, LMBPN had never had a, <laughs> a coming out party. So, <laughs> you know, we had been creating a name for LMBPN, which had been wonderful because of the way that we treat and we interact with our narrators. So Stephen and I are going to to New York. I live in Nevada. I live in Las Vegas. Stephen lives in Florida. And so we're joining there to meet, and we already have these plans that we're going to do a dinner. And we have these plans. where I'm not sure what we're getting into exactly, (laughs) but I'm willing to try. And so we have these these opportunities, and so I'm going to let you guys take that over again. What I loved was that I also connected and met new narrators that I had not met previously that were narrating for you guys. And that was an instant connection, um, an instant, you know, we we all adore you guys and we could talk about that and adore the, the <laughs> writing in the books. Well, seriously. No, really. And um, so that was really fun for me, not only to meet you guys, but also other narrators that are working with LMBPN. One of the fun things about Michael mentioned the dinner, and so we we had arranged for this dinner, and it was going to be after this event that was just filled with narrators, probably ninety percent narrators and maybe ten percent publishers. Does that sound right, Emily? I would say that's pretty accurate, if not ninety-five five. So yes. Okay, so almost almost all narrators, and we're there, and. People just kept coming up to us because we had been, we had been working with them, or some of the narrators that we had been working with would bring their friends around to meet us because they loved working with mm-hmm. us, and they wanted us to meet them in case there there was going to be an opportunity to work with them. And it was just this really amazingly cool evening of uh, for me walking around and going, "Oh my God, that's Scott Brick over there!" Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. You know, things like that, because I am a narrator groupie geek, and I'm just walking around just with my jaw hanging open, 
And that's on one side. And the other side was people that I knew coming up to me and introducing themselves to me. And it was crazy. And we had this little, we had this little table sitting in the back where we were uh, chatting with you when you weren't watching your son or daughter. Son. I always forget. My son. Your son's graduation from first grade? <laughs> Preschool. <laughs> Preschool. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> So mind you, so here's so you were, yeah, here's the picture of that. We're we we are off by ourselves, so to speak, and we're talking in the shade and we're enjoying. There's probably eight to fourteen of us during this event. And Emily is so apologetic. She's like, I have to go watch my son graduate. And my heart is like, oh my God, you know, what what are we talking about? She goes, He's graduating from preschool. And I'm just kind of <laughs> looking at her like Okay. You gave me so much shit about that. Julie was on my side. Julie knew it. But it was like, oh, man. Yes, my wife, Julie, was totally on your side. And I was totally on your side, too, because I wouldn't have wanted to miss that. And we appreciated you <laughs> coming to New York to meet with us yes. and, and missing that, but being able to watch it via live stream. Okay. But that was just an amazing evening. But you're missing the fact she, she had full gear headphones on. <laughs> These weren't little <laughs> tiny white headphones. These were cans they were my, my dt 770s they're huge <laughs> they're my studio earphones i brought them because i wanted to be able to hear <laughs> oh oh it was so precious but that's a memory <laughs> that'll just stay forever so, <laughs> um, oh. so go ahead steve you, you were talking about the the that's the event before the dinner yes and i kept and I know what was going on because a couple times I would hear you say as I'm leaving, where is he going? <laughs> and it's like, I just wanted to keep going around and meeting people. And, you know, you're sitting back there talking to people and conversing, and I'm just wandering around like a groupie. If I had narrator cards, I would have been getting them signed. So it was just, it was a really fun night. We had this amazing dinner afterwards uh, with with all of our favorite narrators and Troy Odie, who does a lot of post-production for us. It was a magnificent evening where we really got to socialize and get to know people well. And then the conference started the next day. And that was, um, that, that was, was also awesome. fascinating. Yes, completely. Um, I had no idea that you were doing the groupie thing because I just thought meeting yeah, people that you totally. had, uh, you had already set up meetings with. So I was like, Oh, well he's just, you know, <laughs> If I had well, it was that too, but I would be walking around and going, oh, oh that's, oh, I know them. I, I can't, names and faces escape me. So the fact that you're able to recognize someone in a relaxed atmosphere is that event um, just is astounding. Well, it was, it was kind of astounding to me because a little bit like Emily, not everyone looks exactly like their, <laughs> their picture. <laughs> that's not quite a now, Emily, in her case, had just had her hair cut. But there are a lot of people, and so I'm just like studying people. It's like I think I, oh yeah, I know who you are. So it was, it was, it was really fun, and the conference was educational, and we learned just how quickly the growth of audio is is going, and and just how exciting this entire field is. So it is at that, and then I, we I'll wrap up this part of the story with that. It was at that conference that I approached you and said, hey, would you like to be? the VP of, of audio production, and would you join us officially in this capacity? And what did I say? Uh, you told me you'd think about it. <laughs> 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 oh, yes. And I'm like, okay, awesome, yes. <laughs> I was wondering if you were going to tell the truth or you're going to let that lie stand there. <laughs> Looking around like, really? And then the last night, there are the Audi Awards, and Emily had been uh, nominated. Sadly, she did not win because there <laughs> was a right. mistake on the part yeah. of the judges. <laughs> the counting was all wrong. Hanging yes. chads, hanging chads. We were a group but favorite, like, though. Like almost everyone who goes to an, an award ceremony, you see, you see people on the red carpet. Emily, can you describe the way you were dressed, Emily? <laughs> not, not what most of the other women were wearing, evening gowns. I am, I, I like a, Personally, I like to have a crotch in what I'm wearing. I'm not a, a dress or skirt person. That's just not me. So I had. Uh, I'm gonna put that somewhere in the book. <laughs> yes, I don't. Yes, I just I had some white pants and a black blazer and a colorful shirt and my favorite shoes of all time. Oh, and I had galaxy and, socks on too that you guys didn't see. But oh, I didn't even notice. Those. They're my space but, socks. But describe the shoes. 
Um, they're galaxy shoes. They have the galaxy on them, and then the part around the bottom lights up and strobes and flashes. Those I are... actually would look for you in this. There was the Naughty Awards that we were at, and I would look for you by kind of looking down at the floor trying to find the flashes of light. It, our our taxi uh, dropped us off at the wrong restaurant, so we had to walk several blocks to the right place. And I turned them on during that walk, and the looks that I got on the, the streets of New York, it was really funny. So, yes. That was, and then uh, Michael had these candies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he brought these candies, little LMBPN candies, along with some other really cool trinkets. And he decided to play this game where... You'd walk up to people and you'd give them the candy and they could either eat the candy and get an instant reward or they could trust you and believe that they could go up, take this little piece of candy to the bar and the bartender would give them a free drink. Taking the candy away. Yes, not getting the candy, but getting a, a maybe a better reward depending on how important alcohol is versus candy. Yes. <laughs> and what did you do a scientific study of the results? It um so one Judith and Julie didn't believe that this was a good idea. I just want to leave that out there. They didn't believe us. Because Getting candy we, to strangers, really? <laughs> <laughs> well, we we had these things of course and the naughty is the first time that we were at them and we were just kind of promoting LMBPN in a fun way. So I was like, I think this is a good idea. Now my wife comes from a ex, uh, uh, an enterprise background. So she didn't think this was such a wise suggestion. And I'm like, I'm totally right. So I went to the bartender and explained, which takes not one explanation. It takes a few sentences for them to go, okay, so I accept this. I give them a drink and put it on your tab. Exactly. So explain this to me again. Oh God. So I go through it and I finally get him to say it. And we go to the people and remarkably enough, I was expecting everyone to go get a, a drink. And almost two out of three easily kept the candies. They kept the chocolate. And there were M&Ms inside of it. So that's, that's really kind of what's it. So one person who went for a drink went because he, couldn't, he uh, couldn't handle the sugar. So he's like, easy, I'll just go get a drink because I can't eat this anyway. There you go. That was, I think Scott Brick might have been that person. And then a couple of others. But <laughs> what happened to me was every time that someone would be like, okay, I'm going to get a drink. I'm like, great. They would find me five minutes later and say, the bartenders don't know anything about this. And I'm like, what? And what happened is every time I explained it to a bartender and they would say, yes, I didn't realize there was another bar on the roof and the suckers would be going up there. And then no bartenders at our level would know what's going on. <laughs> I didn't and know so, there was a bar up there either. <laughs> yeah. And funny. so it's like everybody I explained to disappears. And then finally, at the end, the original bartender comes back down. <laughs> and so it's like, oh, but yes, most of them kept the candy. I still have mine. But the, net, the net result of all that is a lot more people knew who LMBPN was or LMBPN publishing was by the end of the night. Yes. You guys were completely the buzz of the whole conference. I don't know what you're talking about a night. You guys, every, everybody was talking about you guys the whole time. Oh, why? So, I'll accept because it. <laughs> because you guys are so awesome and everybody's gushing about how awesome it is to work with you guys and what nice guys you are and how it's, it's, it, it you're a personable company. We don't get that too often. There, there's a handful. Um, but you know, you guys were just, and the new kids on the block kind of coming in. And yeah. so everybody wants to meet you too. So that was fun. And I, I enjoyed a whole lot, Steve, being able to tell people when they see him, I said, you know what? I am really pleased to be able to meet you, but the one you really want to talk to is that white-haired guy over there. <laughs> is the guy? Yeah, I like black LMBP and T-shirt Santa Claus. That one right there. Now I'm not going with the Santa Claus thing. <laughs> There's a certain connotation of heft there that I'm not. I'm just not owning. You're, you're gonna. <laughs> and have I couldn't to get grow him. a Santa Claus beard if I had to. We're gonna get you a neon vest next time that lights up, so everybody can know who you are. Go to the guy in the neon light-up vest. You know, for to for those that don't know Stephen that well, he is awesome on any podcast and, and his voice. But in life, in, in really in life, he's a little reserved, like you might think CFOs are. We recently took <laughs> we recently took Steve to a concert, and it, <laughs> <laughs> it was it was a Journey and a Def Leppard. Oh my god! Now, Steve thinks he doesn't know any of these songs, any of them. And so Steve has this uh, really excellent friend who's been around for decades called Silent Bob. And so, well, okay, I call him Silent Bob. I assume he calls him 
Bob. Now, Silent Bob knows Steve really well. So we have this agreement going or this this um, bet going that Steve's not going to know that many journey in Def Leppard. And I end up winning both of them. But shockingly, I look because the way that the seats were, Steven is behind me. So if I think he knows the song, I have to look over my shoulder and, and we can't hear anything if you talk. So I put up like two fingers and he's like, yes or no or whatever. And so that was quite funny. But yeah, in, in like neon, you say getting him a neon vest. It, I mean, it would be an effort to get him to do that. I had never been to a stadium concert before in my life. And no, true what? story. I called Julie to say, and this is probably the exact way I said it. We're going to a concert tonight. Oh, no. it's Journey and somebody called Def Leppard. And Julie just cracks up laughing because she knows how much I love that kind of music. <laughs> and we get there and I, of course, had the best time. It was so much fun. And I, I think I knew six Def Leppard songs, which shocked the wow. heck out of me because I thought maybe one. Yeah. But it's, six. I thought that was pretty good. Yeah. Well, you knew eight or ten journeys. I knew a bunch of journey songs. I knew there might have been only two or three that I didn't know. Yeah. It was really a fun night. <laughs> it was a good wow. time. <laughs> but that's that's why it's like for those that are listening, Stephen Campbell is the guy that is responsible for managing and handling our audio productions. And he's done it in such a way and grown it in such a way that people are just respecting the hell out of our audio group. So accolades to you, man. Big Thank time. you. That's very, very Big nice time. of you to say. All right. We need to wrap up because yes. we're going. I think we were probably shooting for 20 minutes <laughs> know, and right? we're at an hour and four minutes right now. But Emily, I want to ask, I want to wrap up by asking you a, a question. And when is TK Eco 1 coming out? Oh. No, that's not the question. Oh. You can ask that. That can be your <laughs> final question, part, part three. But What's it like working on an iconic series like Michael's series? Is, do you feel like in any way that you're typecast now as a, as a sci-fi person? Ooh, good, per good question. I would say I'm kind of typecasting myself as that now because I'm, I'm so passionate about uh, this this genre now, because before, to be honest, I used to be cast for a lot of romance, lots of romance. And Ooh, now a, what's a clip of romance? Oh, geez. Oh, so much. <laughs> oh, there's so yeah, much. Can you just give us a little something? Oh God. In the heat of the moment stuff. I don't no, not off the cuff. I can't, <laughs> I could, I could get my heavy breathing out. Is that okay? No, you that's just fine. Want me to <laughs> breathe heavily into the microphone. Um, but <laughs> What was the question again? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> uh, at first, you know, I was a little nervous because I knew how there was, the fans were so passionate about this series. So passionate. And I kind of got online a little bit and looked at, at the Cartherian Gamut Facebook page and people are so into this series. And so I was a little, I was very nervous at first. Um, but then after the first book, couple books came out, I got just amazing messages. Your fans, Michael, are just incredible. They're oh, lovely, lovely, and and lots of just get, encourage encouragement, you know, and really rooting for me and made me feel excellent going forward. And I just, now all I want to do is strong kick-ass female characters. That's, I feel like... This has just been a, a dream, a dream series. And there's so many strong females in all the offshoots. It's just, it's a breath of fresh air for me. And it's something that I'm excited when my daughter's a little older to, <laughs> to listen, to listen to, because I mean, really Bethany Ann's a role model. Absolutely. And, um, it's, it's just been fabulous, but I, I would like to typecast myself for science fiction. <laughs> uh, so I hope so. Oh. I'll, I'll just say I hope so. <laughs> okay. So, um, cause I was wondering, cause and thank you, by the way, just from the bottom of my heart for everything that you've done to make this series successful, it would not have been the same without you and your ability to bring John and the other men into it as well has been kind of jaw droppingly great. Thank you. I'd like to under and with this, I am going to kind of pitch a little bit. What about Katie and Pandora? Oh my God! This is I protected by them. the damned. 
Yes. I love, oh, I love Pandora. You know, I just, oh, she's so. Fresh of breath air. Oh, man. <laughs> Not politically correct in any way whatsoever. Yes. She's like who I would love to be if I didn't have to have a filter on at all ever. And it's, it's, it's so awesome. And just how I think her and Katie are just an awesome match. Really. I, you know, I'm only two books in right now. I'm starting on book three, but I'm excited to see where their banter goes in the future, because I think that Pandora is really good for Katie and yeah. vice versa. Yeah. So I it's, love the, I, I love, I love the di dynamic there. Absolutely. All right. So I guess I got, I cheated with that question, but it really is something that and it's not that series, by the way, for those that are listening, is not for everybody. <laughs> um, it is, if you will, an opportunity for me to be non-politically correct, because, you know, if you have a multi thousand year old <laughs> demon, uh, female demon um, uh, come down with an attitude, she doesn't give two flying F's what she says. There's nothing that she's going <laughs> to. And so she is just kind of raw and passionate. But. Katie ends up using that over the, the the 15 books that we have out now. And when you see who she becomes, I think, you know, should you get it done by APAC next year, <laughs> then, you know, you'll give me a hug. Yeah. Yes. I know I will. I, even without this, I would. <laughs> okay. Well, it's all there. All right. And, and book one in this series, so somebody can actually promote this thing correctly, is Torn Asunder. Oh. And it's oh, the sorry, protected, yes. protected by the damn series. Uh, it, the actual author name on this is Michael Todd, which is a pseudonym for Michael and his co-author in the series, Lori Starkey. And of course, Emily is the narrator for this. Yes. Yes. Thank you for that, Steve. We should have said the title, <laughs> and, the actual title, so people can oh, find it. Sucked. Oh my if gosh, anybody, yeah. if anybody's still listening. <laughs> and Emily. I, Emily, I just want to say thank you as well. It has been such a delight to work with you, and, and you really are a big part of the foundation of LMBPN Audio. It's, it's been a privilege working with you. You are so funny and such a delight to work with. It, it's been a pleasure for the last however long it's been, 18 to 24 months. I'm not even sure, but I, I hope it's another until I'm not doing this anymore. Right. Me too. That's, it's just been Period awesome, guys. You guys are yeah. awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you all very much for listening to this episode of Ear Crush. If you're not already subscribed, please do so. You can, you can find all the subscribe links at lmbpn.com slash earcrush.